Hello everyone, welcome to a new edition of Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Today, my guest is Dr. Laura Charlesworth. Laura, welcome, nice to have you with us. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, and uh, today's subject is uh, about uh, coping in cancer care, uh, coping as a useful tool to support people with cancer. Uh, Laura, I have to admit that coping in cancer care is one of my, let's say, favorite uh, subjects within uh, psycho-oncology. And I would like uh, to ask you for the beginning um, to define in your own words uh, what you understand on coping with cancer. We all know the official definitions, we know a lot of different uh, interpretation, but uh, from your experience, how you can define this? Yes. So if I can start by saying that um, I actually never set out to look at coping specifically. So my research was very open about the perception of needs of people who had severe mental illness and uh, or people who have severe mental illness and a cancer diagnosis. But what I discovered through interviewing and speaking with this population is that they talked about many factors that were all interconnected by coping. And outside of the definitions, you know, Lazarus and Folkman, et cetera, around what we really mean by coping in you know, the ability to deal with change and adapt, what this actually looked like for the people who I spoke with in my research is their ability to manage their mental illness without deterioration uh, of the oh. mental illness. Um, sorry, Adrian, can you hear the noise in the background? It's not a problem. No, it's okay. Um, so the um, what they really were talking about in terms of deterioration is maladaptive coping mechanisms around the mental illness. So that included things like reaching crisis point, um, turning to substance misuse, self-harm, and suicidal ideation. So that is the reference point really when I'm talking about coping in this situation is these individuals ability to avoid ending in that crisis point with their mental illness. Uh, you mentioned maladaptive coping uh, mechanism. Uh, in the case of severe mental illness, uh, the patients are doing, let's say instinctively, because uh, in the case of the majority of cancer patients, they are doing in a way to feel better. But mm -hmm. in uh, the case you mentioned, uh, it's instinctively done this maladaptive. Not necessarily. It's, that's just the point to which they turn. Uh, because for many of these people, they've experienced that before. And so when their mood deteriorates, they feel like they're not receiving the help that they need. Uh, their stress levels, their anxiety levels increase and their, you know, their severe mental illness, illness deteriorates, the strategies that they turn to are those maladaptive coping mechanisms. I wouldn't say they're necessarily instinctive, but they're poss possibly familiar. Okay, because in the other case, uh, they are trying uh, to, to make it better, but uh, <laughs> they are doing worse. So uh, this, yeah. uh, this uh, was uh, the questions about, you mentioned about severe mental illness. Um, in uh, before we go further, I would like briefly uh, to to mention or to explain what exactly means severe mental illness or SMI for our yes. our audience. Just briefly in large terms. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually really complicated to to give you a single definition and in my study there's a whole section really dedicated to trying to explain that and there's been evolution of the definition of severe mental illness over many decades so it, in its simplicity there are two different ways really of um, describing it one is through classification of disease types so we might here talk about things like um schizophrenia bipolar disorder we might categorize by condition or disease type um, or we could talk about that in terms of how it actually impacts and affects on a on a person and that is actually what I've selected to do in my research is to say that severe mental illness is actually uh, an illness that affects somebody in the long term so for a duration of two or more years 
It also is something that affect, affects their day-to-day -day life um, and they are seeking support from mental health services um, for their mental illness. So I chose not to go down the route of only including specific diagnoses. And that's for multiple reasons that again gets complicated, but not everybody with an SMI has a, a natural definition. Um, so I think it would have excluded a group of the population had I have chosen to go down the route of saying only people with a definition of schizophrenia may be included in the study. And uh, uh, you are talking now as a research from uh, your study, working yes. in, a, let's say, hospital or in private uh, research? Yeah, so in private research, so um, through the point of my research, I was employed by multiple different organisations, but mostly academic institutions. My and However, my recruitment um, strategy was to have open recruitment for anybody to express an interest should they have seen the study. But I was also supported by having nine um, uh, uh, public health organisations on board to help me to identify potential participants. Because uh, I, I can imagine it's very difficult uh, to make a study because in Romania it was also very difficult for me to make a research or a study uh, on coping uh, mechanism in my county because um, uh, in Romania, as I, as I always said, it is a gap between, uh, of two years between the first symptom of cancer and the diagnosis. So uh, it is uh, very difficult to make a research because after two years, when you find out that you have cancer <laughs> from two years, uh, you don't have time to complete questionnaires, to uh, complete tests and so on. So, uh, it was very difficult for me also, and I imagine for you as well, uh, especially with uh, people with other uh, illness than uh, cancer. And uh, now we come to our subject. Uh, how is <laughs> a patient that uh, experiences uh, severe uh, mental illness, uh, let's say, uh, reaction or a response to a cancer diagnosis or to a cancer treatment what is different from a not normal but for the majority of cancer patients yeah so i think it's a really interesting question and there's actually quite a lot that's different um when you when you really take the time to explore and speak to people who've who've been through this and i think the first thing is that this starts way before their cancer diagnosis and many people who've got severe mental illness are very familiar utilizing healthcare often and um, are known to their general practitioner, their family doctor, um, and also some mental health services, you know, depending on the sort of structure um, regionally and, you know, geographically. So this starts where many of these individuals that I spoke with had their physical symptoms overlooked. And that phenomenon is known as diagnostic overshadowing. And that's because they're complex individuals uh, with complex health circumstances. So they'll present themselves to their health professional with a, with a physical symptom. And in many cases, that's overlooked uh, or it's attributed to their mental illness. So if I can give you one example from, um, from my research is I had a participant who has had... Um, who has mul multiple severe mental illness diagnoses, one of which relates to a very complex eating disorder that she'd had for many years. I think um, it was about 35 to 40 years that this individual had managed this particular eating disorder. And all of a sudden, well, over a period of time, she developed a very swollen abdomen and had sought help on multiple occasions and often was told this is this is a problem due to your malnutrition because you're not you're not getting enough nutrition you're not eating and drinking enough and she said but I've lived with this for many years and this has never happened before and I'm very uncomfortable and I feel very different and I'm in a lot of pain and that is unusual for me and what happened to that individual is actually she she, she then was sectioned under the mental health act and admitted to a hospital setting where she was had a feeding tube and was fed through you know through that mechanism and about four months after that um she actually went into accident and emergency department because her pain was so extensive and upon having a ct scan 
discovered that she'd got a watermelon sized tumour in her ovary. So her symptoms were just put down to the fact that she'd got this mental illness and that the manifestation of what was happening was a, was a symptom of that. And that wasn't the only case that I heard of this diagnostic overshadowing. It actually happened uh, across multiple cases of my study. So it starts right there. And um, then I find that, or found that these individuals actually upon the point of diagnosis, whilst their actual experience of diagnosis was very important to them, and quite often was the, the news was delivered in poor in a poor um, way, so on a ward, on their own, without family members present, unaware that they were going to a, a medical setting to receive this life-changing news, you know, a short 10-minute appointment to tell them they've got cancer and then just given an awful lot of information that they were unable to process. That was very difficult for them. But actually, not very long after that diagnosis, there was a a moment of thinking, actually, I can be quite positive about this. And I think that's quite unique for this population. Now, um, again, I don't want to generalise this to everybody with SMI and cancer, but I think this is about um, all of my participants had lived with their SMI for a long time. I'm talking 20 plus years. And I think there was a visualisation of the cancer being a short term transient illness that would come and go. I've got this diagnosis, I'll have treatment and it will go. Whereas their mental illness, they're aware that they're living with this for life. You know, their mental illness will never be cured, it will be managed. And so there was this different approach of how do I actually tackle the cancer that I've got and seeing it as a, okay, I can do this, I can, this will come and it will go and it's an area of focus. And um, so it sort of happened initially for some, for, for several participants actually. They also sort of go into the health system for their cancer care using the strategies that they've got already. So many of them had their own strategies for resilience. They were self-advocating for their care. They were imagining sort of a new future. The cancer diagnosis was the point of thinking, actually, do I want to live in this place after my treatment? Do I want to have these people in my life? It was kind of a moment of reimagining a future, a future me. Um, but what happens is they go into the system with all of these strategies for resilience. And because of the behaviours and the experience, sadly, that they encountered in the healthcare system, those strategies for resilience were were kind of broken down. They were unable to use them because they weren't being listened to. They didn't feel that their their mental health was taken into consideration. They didn't feel that they got listened to and treated as a whole person. Um, So that's sort of what's happening whilst they're having their treatment. I think there's a Sorry, Adrian, I know this is a very long answer to this question, but I'm taking you sort of through the through the journey. Once they then start having treatments, that's also really fascinating because many of my participants did not describe having full set of information, um, the an appraisal of treatment options presented to them. Many of them were just told you should have this treatment. This is the best treatment for you without actually explaining lots of the long-term effects of those treatments or other treatment options. So I think shared decision-making was very much reduced. And particularly here in in the England and in the UK health system, we're really trying to drive towards that as being a really important factor of care. So that shared decision-making, personalised care, taking into consideration everything about that person. Actually, for this group of individuals, they really described the opposite of that. You know, decisions were sort of made on their behalf sometimes without them even really knowing and understanding that that was happening. So um, so that's kind of the treatment side of, of things. And then the living with and beyond cancers, the point at which their treatment is, is completed and they're no longer having kind of ongoing ready access to, to their oncology healthcare system, they really struggled. And that was because they, all of a sudden, there's a reality that the cancer actually isn't a transient disease. They're living with the effects of the cancer itself or the treatment there's fear of recurrence uh there's all of those sort of aspects that we know about the sort of survivorship phase for people with this disease that then suddenly become a reality and that's when they're sort of again because they don't have the support in place their ability to cope is is very much diminished and along that journey I found from the people that I spoke with that that specialized support that these people need was unavailable so our systems are very separate so health healthcare for your cancer is over here and healthcare for your mental health is over here and the two don't come together and the mental health system is so complex that they didn't really accommodate the 
the kind of cancer and the impact of the cancer. In many cases, the mental health professionals didn't even know that the individuals had cancer unless they shared it with them. And in the cancer setting, the professionals were unable, nervous, uncomfortable, didn't have time, didn't have the specialist expertise to support the specialist mental health needs that this group has. And we have, you know, big charities here in England, Macmillan, you know, who provide a really great standard of care. But what my participants were finding is that because they're not they're not experiencing anxiety and depression that's occurred because they've got cancer, they've got this pre-existing complex need that the specialists were unable to provide that support because really they need, you know, that that very, very highly specialist support, which wasn't available to them. So that's in a that's in a, a long description really of what it's actually like for the, for this group of people. And I think there are some some unique aspects of of um circumstances for, for this group. Uh I uh, would like to go a little bit back um, to the moment of uh, diagnosis. And um, I would like to ask you, maybe um, seems uh, my questions, uh, 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 let's say, um, childish, but I have to ask. Uh, normally, uh, when <clears throat> a person which became a cancer patient receive a cancer diagnosis, uh, automatically uh, the defense mechanism appeared. And only after we can talk about coping mechanism. In the case of severe mental illness patients, could we talk about defense mechanism? Or uh, there are signs that they applied like, I don't know, fear or uh, hope or uh, uh, did you notice this coping? Yes. Uh, this uh, defense mechanism before coping? Not really, not really. And and I think that was surprising to me, actually. I I think, how can I articulate this? So there was, there was more, the negativity around the cancer diagnosis wasn't so much around why is this happening to me? You know, the kind of the shock, anger. They didn't really describe that. They described anger and frustration in relation to the, process of how the information was given or that they were frustrated that it had taken them two years to be listened to and that they knew that, that something was wrong but it wasn't so much about an anger or you know the defense around actually having the cancer it was more around the care that they'd received but actually I think quite quickly when I said to them you know the, the question that I asked was what stood out to you at the time of having a diagnosis and for many of them they described actually what it did was make me think yeah I can do this you know, it was almost a positive, okay, here's a challenge that I can can overcome because, you know, as I mentioned, this mental health is long standing and won't ever go away. And I think that is that is different. That is different to it's hard to compare, isn't it? You know, I need to ask five hundred people yeah. who don't have SMI versus five hundred that do. I've just picked a number out of a hat there. But yeah, definitely there definitely wasn't a, and, and actually one of the one of the strategies that they deployed early on, which relates to the resilience was around um, think, thinking about other people who were in a worse situation than them. So quite a lot of them said, you know, yes, the news wasn't great, but I think about this person who's got a child who's got cancer. So they, they were really doing that. They were sort of deferring their feelings onto, but it's so much worse for other people. So I'll just get on with this. And I think that was really interesting. I understand. And I uh, have another question, uh, uh, consequently to what mentioned. Uh, we both know that um, uh, there are two uh, coping skills that work better for cancer patients. It's problem center and emotional center coping. Yeah. Uh, did you or did you not see uh, these two coping uh, strategies to severe mental illness patients or if you saw uh, which was the predominant problem solved or emotional uh, one so so both were described and i don't believe either was dominant so if i think about emotion focused coping initially um this very much came through through those strategies for resilience, which I've already mentioned. So a lot of this was masking their feelings or deflecting their stresses onto other people, you know, who they deemed were facing greater adversity than they were. Um, and they also kind of very much sort of 
did the process of reappraisal. So they reframed their stress and to try and kind of take its meaning in a different way. Um, and I think that one of the ways that they did that is that if a health professional used a, a positive language, you know, such as this is curable, they absolutely just held on to the phraseology that was positive and sort of re reappraise in sort of an emotion focused coping way. Um, but they also very much demonstrated how they attempted to adopt problem focused coping strategies as well. And um, way, so, some examples of that would be through seeking to obtain further information about their diagnosis. So a lot of my participants said, you know, they were actually given very brief information uh, about the diagnosis and the treatment and had to sort of self -ad advocate to find out more. You know, what type of cancer is this? What are my options? Because they weren't given that straight away. Um, so they were trying to make informed decisions. They were trying to be part of their sort of shared decisions about the care and were also seeking out the sort of specialist mental health when they knew that it was deteriorating. But unfortunately, their ability to sort of modify their stress in that way was limited by the environment that they were in in the healthcare setting where the healthcare system actually was unable to, to provide that. I understand. You mentioned uh, <clears throat> reappraisal, and uh, we mm -hmm. all know that there are many uh, uh, there are many different uh, interpretation: positive reappraisal, reappraisal on the problem, etc. Uh, can we talk about self blame or blame the others in the case of uh, severe mental illness patients? Because this is one of the primary feelings. From for a cancer patients or self blame or blame the others. Yes. In this case, can we talk about? Yeah, they didn't. They didn't really talk about that. I think of all of my participants, only one talked about how they felt that perhaps some of their lifestyle behaviours were possibly related to their cancer diagnosis. But that was said in a very much. Um, it was very brief it was a very passing comment and then it, and then it was used to say so after I got a diagnosis I thought I would try and have a better lifestyle because I think I probably got cancer because of my smoking and alcohol consumption um so it's almost like a little bit of self-blame there but it was it was never described in that way and certainly there was you know there was no reference to blaming others um uh, was, it, it, it might be also a, que a question of cultural background for example, yes. in, in UK, maybe UK uh, isn't, a, let's say, uh, an entity or a state where you blame the others. For example, in Eastern Europe, blaming the others, <laughs> it's part of our uh, daily life. So it might be also a cultural background. Possibly. Possibly, yeah. And I think, like I say, I think because they, I think it's really significant that the complexity of the lives of these people that they've, you know, like I said, most of, the, most of my participants described having their SMI diagnosis for those that were, and all but one had a, a formal diagnosis, came in their sort of late teenage, early 20s years. And if I said the average age of my participants was 50, they've dealt with really complex life situations. You know, I, I don't know if we'll come on to talk about relationships, but, you know, there's a lot of complex discussion about their relationships, their personal relationships, their relationships with help, with the healthcare system. Um, but so I think they've just, they've dealt with really difficult situations like having a cancer diagnosis already. So they were almost prepared for that in a, in a way that actually maybe many people that haven't got SMI wouldn't be. And I think that might be why there's a slight difference in that sort of immediate response to the diagnosis that we see. Uh, you mentioned uh, previously that uh if I understand correctly, in general, they receive the cancer diagnosis alone. Uh, yes. Without a member of a family or, a, or that, without a caregiver. I would like to talk about a little bit of, about the patients who has a, a family or a caregiver. Uh, which is the role of mm -hmm. a caregiver or spouse or children uh, with focus to coping and mm -hmm. also the negative uh, consequences for him or her in this case. Yes. Yeah, I, 
I think if I've understood the question correctly, it's about what is the role of the caregiver et cetera, yeah. in, in relation to helping yeah. these individuals cope. This is a this is a really fascinating area that um, I'm really interested in exploring in more detail because relationships came through really strongly. So for in fact, it came came up in every single interview. And for some of those interviews, the relationship was a positive factor that enabled their coping. And that was particularly where there was a close relationship with a family member that could have been a spouse. It could have been aunts, children, etc., who were able to support them, um, give them encouragement, um, do some of the very practical aspects, drive them to the hospital appointments, sit, you know, talk through information, help them interpret information. And also to help them to identify when their mental health was deteriorating, um, which was a, an important role. So absolutely, that relationship, uh, whoever it is, was facilitative to their coping. Many of my participants talked about relationships in, an, in a negative sense. Um, I didn't have anyone to go to the hospital with me. I can't do this anymore on my own. Sort of really moving into that sort of helplessness space because they don't actually have that support structure around them. And, you know, for, for some, it actually broke down relationships. One of my participants talked quite extensively about the fact that because they didn't get help, the specialist psychological help, their partner actually sadly faced, you know, all of that with them and, and that their relationship didn't kind of make it through that very complex situation. And they felt very much that if they had got that psychological support, that probably would have been different. So I think in summary, that a caregiver, a good caregiver is facilitative to coping for people with SMI and cancer. The absence of that, and that can be, you know, close relationships, but also the sort of wider societal relationships was really damaging and impacted very negatively on their coping. Uh, we <clears throat> don't have much uh, time, so I will go to the last question. Uh, yes. You said about the positive role of uh, caregivers. Uh, in a, a coping process for SM, SMI uh, patients. But during uh, your experience, uh, during the study, did you uh, met situations uh, when a caregiver walk away or uh, from someone with uh, severe mental illness? So it try and try and try and at the moment just can't get it anymore. Did you face some so, situations? So in most parts, no. There was one relationship that was described that broke down, but that it wasn't positioned to me as the caregiver walked away because they couldn't cope. It was it was that their relationship broke down and it sounded like it was an equal, you know, contribute contributory decision. Um, but I think it's it's important to say that actually many of my participants did not have a close caregiver. So for some of them, they didn't have anybody who they would describe in that way and were very much going through this alone or with the support of a, you know, a, a support worker, a healthcare support worker who would take them to their appointments or they've got relationships kind of in society, but the closeness of those relationships is very limited. So they're, you know, their acquaintances or loose friends, they're not close relatives, if that makes sense. So it might not be a reflective answer, given that many of them wouldn't have had a close caregiver to have experienced that situation. Yeah, which is uh, unfortunately a uh, pity to, to yes. face a severe mental illness alone and then a cancer diagnosis, when for some of us, even uh, with family support, it's also very difficult and all the family structure is uh, changing and all the uh, strategies or the plans are destroyed. So uh, I only just imagine how it can be or how they can feel about it. Uh, Laura, if you want to say a final yeah. thing. I think on that is that actually for some of my participants it was a reason why they didn't continue with their cancer treatment. So actually, if we were looking at clinical outcomes in relation to cancer mortality or you know progression-free survival, actually not having relationships and someone to support them through that feeling of helplessness meant that they just chose they couldn't 
they couldn't do that anymore and I think that is really significant and and there are probably ways to support that I think by thinking about peer support models thinking about having a you know a named support supportive contact it doesn't have to be someone with really comprehensive clinical expertise you know it's a it's an advocate and a a, a buddy or a you know somebody who's just with them that, that could help that I think we would see a change in uptake and treatment compliance and you know a, a, a desire to continue to go through the, the process very interesting Laura thank you very much for your thank time you. thank you very much for being with us today for all this interesting information about uh, a not easy subject to debate within uh, psych oncology, within cancer care, and good luck on your research, on your work, and on your future research. Thank you for being with us today. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onca Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.